I want to open our program. It's a really special one for lunch. Um, as you know, yesterday our keynote breakfast speaker was George Gascon, and uh, I think um, we have the equivalent in star power uh, today for our luncheon keynote. Um, the Honorable Gerbeer Graywall is the is New Jersey's 61st Attorney General. He was appointed by Governor Philip Murphy um, in December. Uh, he's a remarkable speaker, remarkable man, um, and you'll soon see why. He first came to John Jay a couple of months ago and I heard him uh, speak with students um, and faculty here and I was immediately captivated um, by his energy and his ideas. Uh, and to me, I mean, he'll tell you himself, he's part of the, exactly what we were talking about earlier in, the, in this, the week about the movement towards progressive prosecutors, towards new ideas, towards a bipartisan approach to criminal justice reform that, with any luck, will actually achieve some sort of traction. Um, so a little bit more about the Attorney uh, General. He was um, uh, the Bergen County prosecutor just before becoming AG, uh, which meant he was the chief law enforcement officer of the most populous county in New Jersey. And for those of you who don't know, if you just look around, New Jersey is right across the river. You can barely see it. <laughs> That's the mainland. That's the, that's the United States right there. We're, we're sort of here on. Um, uh, at Bergen County, he developed and he implemented Operation Helping Hand, which is a program that offers low-level uh, drug offenders treatment options upon arrest. Something we're going to be talking about this afternoon, and at our next panel. Uh, before that, until 2016, he was an assistant U.S. attorney in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of New Jersey, where he was. Another interesting uh, part of his um, resume, he was chief of the Economics Crime Unit. Um, his full bio is in your programs, so I'm not gonna waste any more time uh, by telling you more about him. And just um, welcome the Attorney General Graywell to, to the podium. Please join me in welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. So I was, uh, well, Stephen, thank you for the introduction. Uh, and thank you for inviting me, first of all. Uh, I was really looking forward to coming here today because uh, I'd have a room full of reporters in this type of setting where you couldn't ask me any questions off topic, uh, but I'm told now that I have to take some questions, so, uh, which is fine. But uh, in all seriousness, I am uh, thrilled to be with you this afternoon and, and to speak with you about a topic that I think fits perfectly with the theme of this conference, violence in America, myth or reality. And in the time that I have, what I want to address is what I think is the Trump administration's reliance on and perpetuation of myths and lies to support their nationalist agenda, which in my mind is actually undermining public safety in this country and contributing to increased violence in this country. The unfortunate reality today is that what we had hoped were just throwaway lines and campaign speeches about, quote, bad hombres, about Mexico not sending us their, quote, best, about immigrants bringing crime and terrorism and drugs with them, about immigrants being rapists, are now being put forward and accepted as facts by some who don't care about the truth, or by others who choose to ignore the truth altogether. And as I'm sure you've already discussed during the course of this symposium, the federal government's own data, their own numbers, show that violent crime in the country has fallen sharply over the last 25 years, and that property crime has fallen over that same period of time as well. And as all of you in this room know, the facts also disprove any claims that there's a link between heightened crime and immigrants. Instead, the actual facts actually show that immigrants commit crime at a lower rate than native-born Americans. And the actual facts also show that the vast majority of drugs brought into this country through our southern border come through ports of entry and not between them. And the actual facts also show that the border wall in El Paso did not directly contribute to the reduction in violent crime that that city saw. The actual facts also show that terrorists are not using our southern border as a means of entering the United States. And the actual facts show that we are not experiencing an unprecedented flood of migrants here. Apprehensions at the southern border are actually near historic lows. 
and that there were fewer than 400,000 apprehensions in 2018 compared to over 1.6 million in 2000. So in short, the actual facts, their own facts, show that there is no emergency at our southern border. Now, the administration offers a completely different narrative, one apparently based on secret facts and set in an alternative universe. Uh, they warn of a, quote, American carnage. They say that America is unsafe, characterized by marauding hordes of inner city criminals, by immigrant caravans carrying disease and terrorism. And they say that the only way to protect us is by putting children in cages and separating families. They say that the only way to keep us safe is by building a wall. And they say that the only thing protecting, quote, real Americans is a tough, harsh brand of justice, one that is heavy on intimidation, but light on compassion. And that intimidation has breathed life into that part of ICE that enforces civil immigration laws and deportation orders. In fact, its former acting director, rather proudly and shockingly, acknowledged that the administration's rhetoric and policies had, quote, taken the handcuffs off the agency. Now, as my state's chief law enforcement officer, I have seen firsthand how all of this rhetoric, how all of the myths and lies has served to undermine public safety in at least three key ways. Now, first, for our immigrant communities, the result is that our federal government has created and cultivated a culture of fear, a fear that drives some of our most vulnerable residents deeper into the shadows. These residents now fear that a traffic stop will land them in a detention center, and so they avoid the day-to-day -day tasks that you and I might take for granted. They fear that a call to the police will end in their deportation. So they don't say anything when they're the victims of violence or fraud. They fear that an ICE officer will be waiting for them at the courthouse. So they refuse to testify at trial against their abuser. Crimes go unreported. Criminals remain on the street and justice goes unserved. And that directly affects public safety. Now, if all of that weren't enough, the second way in which the policies of this administration and the rhetoric out of Washington have impacted public safety is by directly contributing to the rising tide of hate and intolerance that we're witnessing across the country and that I'm seeing in my state. Today, we see people openly questioning the patriotism and the loyalty of their neighbors because of how they look, how they dress, how they worship, or who they love. And these messengers of hate are no longer confined to those dark corners of the internet where they hid in chat rooms before. They've been emboldened to come out. They've been emboldened because some of our leaders have encouraged it and invited it, and because others have countenanced it or ignored it altogether. And as a result, we've seen a rise in hate, hate groups active across this country, and including in New Jersey. And not surprisingly, we've also seen a rise in incidents of bias and hate. The FBI reported that hate crimes were up nearly 17% in 2017, rising for the third year in a row, again, as violent crime fell in this country. And this spike was led with the rise in anti-Semitism. The ADL reported almost 2,000 anti-Semitic incidents in the United States in 2017. That's nearly 60% higher than what they reported in 2016. And over 200 of those incidents took place in my state. But it's not just the numbers. You know, our collective hearts broke when we bore witness to the deadliest attack on Jews in American history. Lives lost and families shattered in Pittsburgh by the twin threats of hate and gun violence. And how can we forget what we saw over a year ago, those images on our televisions of torch-bearing, hate-filled protesters in Charlottesville yelling, quote, Jews will not replace us, out of all places, a college campus. And again, rather than condemn these actions, we were told by our president that there were, quote, some very fine people on both sides. And each of you in this room as journalists are acutely aware of how comments can lead to conduct. The president and this administration have engaged in an all-out war against the media. 
characterizing you as, quote, the enemy of the people, as, quote, crazed lunatics, as fake news, as well as so many other disparaging comments directed at individual journalists. These attacks have not only fed right-wing conspiracy memes and verbal attacks on journalists, but have also legitimized threats and physical attacks directed at journalists in newsrooms. From Charlottesville to Cesar Sayoc Jr. to Pittsburgh to now Coast Guard Lieutenant Christopher Paul Hansen and so many others in between. In the end, it's all of this rhetoric and all of these incidents that serve to undermine our rule of law, our constitutional norms, and our collective safety. The third way in which I see the administration's reliance on myths and lies as undermining our public safety is through their tough on crime and tough on immigration strategies. They not only divert from necessary crime prevention programs, but also represent a return to the failed policies of the past. The president intends to build his wall using, among other sources, funding dedicated to drug interdiction programs. This is money that we could spend in New Jersey fighting our opioid crisis where it's happening, instead of funding a campaign promise, a vanity project that does nothing to save lives on the streets of New Jersey. And here's the other part of it. New Jersey, like many other states, and like the federal government now, has been pushing forward with meaningful criminal justice reforms, policies that attempt to balance punishment with rehabilitation, policies that have not resulted in increased crime in New Jersey. And now, while the President did sign the First Step Act, his inconsistent messaging, messaging that includes recently calling for the death penalty for those who deal drugs, signals, I think, a desire to return to the failed drug wars of the past, wars which did nothing to make us safer and only served to destroy lives, fill our prisons, and further exacerbate racial disparities in our criminal justice system. In the face of all of this, the question naturally becomes, what do we do about it? Well, I think we all have a role to play, those of us in government and each of you in the media. To begin with, for our part, we're using the powers of our office at the New Jersey Attorney General's office to push back through policy making and through litigation, to do everything that we can to advocate for the humanity of our friends and our neighbors. That's why we've challenged the President's border wall emergency. We've challenged the President's Muslim bans. We have fought plans to separate families. We've challenged efforts that make it harder for those seeking asylum in this country. We're opposing the inclusion of a citizenship question on the census. And we've led the fight proudly to save DACA. But more than just push back, we've also used the unique tools of our office to push forward, to show everyone what our vision of a fair and welcoming state looks like. We recently issued a new directive, a law enforcement directive that we called the Immigrant Trust Directive to finally draw a bright, clear line between New Jersey's law enforcement officers on the one hand and federal civil immigration authorities on the other. Our approach is simple. We're limiting the voluntary assistance that New Jersey's law enforcement officers can provide to federal civil immigration authorities. And in doing so, we're telling our state law enforcement officers and agencies to focus their limited resources on their core priorities, such as solving crimes and protecting the public. We don't want them advancing Washington's immigration agenda. And so at a time when it seems like the bonds between law enforcement and the communities we serve are breaking down, we're working to create an environment in New Jersey where all of our residents feel safe around law enforcement officers. And this directive is just one part of our many efforts to strengthen police community relations. We're doing that by promoting transparency, trust, and accountability. We're promoting trust by having over 80 town hall meetings across the state each year, bringing law enforcement and community members together to discuss topics of mutual concern. We're also promoting transparency by bringing independent prosecutors to officer-involved shooting investigations, by releasing videos early in such cases where they may exist. And we're promoting accountability by mandating that law enforcement agencies enact early warning systems and random drug testing policies. So our police departments can identify problem officers well before a crisis. Again, these are just some examples 
of the many, many steps that we're taking to reclaim this moment in New Jersey. But each of you in this room has a role to play. And that role, I think, is to continue pushing forward with the important investigative reporting that each of you have been doing by aggressively following leads and developing sources, by asking difficult questions of public officials like me, and by continuing demanding information through unrelenting public records requests. <laughs> Even those. <laughs> because in the end, that's the type of reporting that promotes meaningful change, especially in our criminal justice system. I see Andrew Ford here. It's reporting like Andrew Ford's Protecting the Shield series, which identified massive gaps in accountability in New Jersey law enforcement and sped up my office's efforts to implement some of the policies that I just talked about. And it's reporting like Sean Sullivan and Steve Sterling and New Jersey Advanced Media's force report. He was a fellow here, I think, last year, Sean Sullivan. That reporting highlighted the inconsistency in use of force reporting across New Jersey and disparities in use of force rates across our state, as well as our failure over the last 17 years to use such reports to identify and track problem officers in any meaningful way whatsoever. That reporting prompted our office to launch an effort to standardize use of force reporting in New Jersey and to now use that new tool as an accountability measure and as a training measure. And of course, it's reporting like the work done by all of those who you honored last night, reporting that exposed the mistreatment of Coast Guard detainees, highlighted flawed law enforcement practices and programs, and exposed wrongful convictions as well as the plight of exonerees. I can't put it any other way. You all are doing meaningful, important work. It's change-provoking work that I think is needed more today than ever before. And know this from someone who has been on the receiving end of those off-hour phone calls and those unrelenting records requests and those off-topic questions at press conferences, I appreciate it. And I encourage you to keep pushing forward, and I thank you for all of your efforts. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, so the floor is yours. Do you have a, a, a mic somewhere? Can, can I get over here? You're giving us one. If not, just shout up and uh, now that you can, go to the bar and just cut, say your name. And, um, I, I'm, I'm Paul Dean from the Clark Brown Center in uh, East Penn. So uh, later on, we're going to be talking about bail reform, eliminating cash bail, obviously. Yep. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. By, by way of background, it was a constitutional amendment uh, in New Jersey that prompted uh, the shift from uh, a cash bail system to a risk-based system, uh, I believe in 2016, and we implemented it beginning in 2017. Uh, my, my, the lesson learned is the sky is not going to fall, right? Uh, everything is going to be just fine. Uh, in 2017, our uh, pretrial detainee population was over 8,000. We're under 4,000 today. And during that same period of time, crime has not increased in New Jersey. The problem that we were contending with, which I'm sure many other jurisdictions are contending with as well, is that we had many, many, many low-risk defendants on low-cash bails who couldn't afford them, who were staying in pretrial way past uh, the time they would serve if they pled guilty, and it was forcing a lot of guilty pleas. Uh, and that's not how we do things, or should be doing things. And so we, it took a while. Uh, we we uh, implemented a risk assessment tool, this, this algorithm. We worked with the Arnold Foundation uh, and others, and we continue to tweak it. Uh, but the, the main takeaway is that it, it's a system that works. Crime has not gone up, and, and it's a fairer system. And it's more like the federal system that I was used to before I came to uh, the state system as a county prosecutor, where you were making individualized determinations in these cases, not just arbitrarily send, setting uh, money bails based on the crimes, and, and that you were taking into account the characteristics of the defendant, the risk of flight, the risk that that person posed or didn't pose, and you had monitoring conditions. Uh, and it's working out. Um, you know, there, there are a couple of things that I would like to tweak, uh, and you know, a couple of patterns that I'm seeing that 
uh, I'd like to look at a little bit more deeply because uh, I have seen that you know, the gang activity that we have in New Jersey is not MS-13 across the state. It's mostly neighborhood gangs in Trenton and our major cities. They've gotten hip to the, the way the risk assessment tool is, and so they're recruiting younger folks who don't have uh, an adult criminal record to be trigger pullers, to be involved in violent crime. Uh, and our risk assessment tool does not right now include juvenile history in it. And so we're talking to our administrative office of the courts to bring that in. So, you know, if that is a pattern that's emerging as a result, that we could stop that and, and make sure that those who pose a risk regardless of their age uh, are kept in, and if they don't, that they be let out. I said nice things, Andrew. <laughs> So, so the question talks about, uh, men, I think all but four states to include New Jersey doesn't have a system of registering and tracking law enforcement officers and, and decertifying them. We don't have a certification process uh, statewide. Uh, you know, we, your reporting, uh, the reporting uh, that New Jersey Advanced Media has done has highlighted uh, some instances or a number of instances. I, I won't say that there are an incredible number of them, but there are certainly enough to raise concern where individuals have either moved from one department to the other uh, and they have a, a terrible IA history that might not have followed them or that they had red flags that weren't uh, you know, identified early or used uh, to hold folks accountable. Uh, I would just say that you know, the, the, the tool, I mean, the, the certification system is certainly one option. Uh, it's certainly something we're looking into uh, a little bit more closely, but we're trying other things as well. You know, I came into office in, Fe uh, in January of last year. In February, we implemented early warning systems. Uh, they were never mandated for law enforcement across New Jersey. We implemented random drug testing. Believe it or not, it was never required across New Jersey. Uh, we issued uh, a directive to promote transparency, trust, and accountability by saying, you know what, if we have footage, a body cam footage or dash cam footage uh, of use of force incidents or of officer-involved shootings, we will turn it over and not hold it on an OPRA, you know, even though we might have an exemption under our Open Public Records Act, within 20 days or after 20 days because we need a period of time in which to uh, do our, in our initial investigation, do interviews where people give us their recollection and not what they see on TV. And so those are steps that were taken. And all I could say, you know, we're trying uh, to tweak the early warning system directive. You've identified some issues with that. Uh, we've identified issues with that. Uh, and we're taking it uh, as a process. And so uh, if we could, if we could um, have increased accountability to, through the measures we've taken, then we'll, we'll use that system. And if there's other options we need to explore, we'll explore them as well. You've asked me that one before, though. <laughs> <laughs> respond to this wave, if it is a wave, whether you see it as having real traction and a future? So, I mean, I think, you know, there's certainly, well, let me back up and say this. I mean, for those of you from not, who are not from this area, I am probably one of seven attorneys general who, who are not elected. Uh, so I'm appointed uh, by our governor and confirmed by our state senate. And so I think that gives me a little bit more freedom to be progressive, that I don't have to fundraise, I don't have to, you know, justify my actions. I could do the right things for the right reasons without having to worry about going out and campaigning for funds. Uh, and so, 
that's a little bit different, I think, than most other states. And, and I see that when we have discussions about signing on to uh, lawsuits with other AGs. I think, you know, I see the thought process in their heads. They're thinking about, well, how's this going to affect me next time I've got to go, you know, uh, talk in the central part of my state and I have voters there and maybe I can't be that progressive on uh, gun safety issues. For me, I don't have to worry about any of that or somebody putting out a scorecard about how uh, I'm all in on gun safety and, and, and on anything that we can do to uh, make sure that only those individuals that should have firearms get them and that we hold accountable those who traffic in, uh, whether it's partially completed firearms or uh, 3D printable guns, and we're on the front of that issue. And I think a lot of that is because we don't have to worry about um, the electorate. Having said that, I think you are seeing a lot of progressive uh, policies come out on issues where you wouldn't expect it before both sides of the aisle, on criminal justice reform. I think that everyone is all in on that, and I think that's just a recognition that whatever we were doing in the past wasn't working. And I think on opioids, for example, you are that is one issue from the attorneys general where you'll probably get signed on from all 50 when we're trying to look at alternatives to incarceration and diversion programs and pushing forward policies along those lines. So I think, you know, there are certain things that we're all sort of trending towards, you know, more progressive policies, realizing how we were handling these issues in the past wasn't working. Uh, law enforcement accountability is probably another one where there's broad consensus where you might not have accepted it, expected it before. Um, but, you know, I think Truly, at the AG level, we're still about 20 of us uh, who, who are just, um, you know, fully in on a lot of the, uh, the major issues that you're talking about at the conference. Um, at the local level, I, I don't have uh, enough visibility to, 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 uh, to comment on, but you're seeing a trend, though, for sure. Which one? <laughs> the latest one? Yeah. Okay. Have you had discussions with AGs from states that haven't signed on and what have been their reasons? So um, without getting into specific conversations, I think a lot of times, you know, on this one, I think there's probably just a concern of standing uh, on the border wall. Um, and, and my thought there is that, you know, everything that the administration has said uh, as to where they're going to pull funding from, whether it's diverted uh, forfeiture funds or diverting drug interdiction funds or diverting construction funds for military bases, touches New Jersey. And I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that they don't pull those funds. And if down, you know, later on in the litigation, it turns out that they decided not to take funds from New Jersey, then I'll gladly bow out then, but I'm going to do everything I can now to use the discovery process to dig into it. And so I think, you know, th that's my theory uh, and, and that's my take on it, but I think it probably goes back to what I was saying uh, in reference to uh, Stephen's question. I don't have to, um, you know, justify my actions to an electorate. And I think, you know, those types of considerations uh, are, are you know, more difficult for those who are elected AGs. I could just say, you know, there are two questions we ask ourselves. Is what the administration is doing unlawful and does it affect New Jersey? And if I can answer yes to both, which I'm doing increasingly more and more uh, over the last two years, uh, then we will get involved. But there are cases where we decide not to get involved or let uh, others take the lead. But has there been any kind of process? I mean, oh, yeah, there's a, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, yeah, there is a process. I mean, there's the Democratic Attorneys General Association, uh, and when, you know, briefs are being shopped around or when complaints are being shopped around, uh, there are states that naturally gravitate towards the lead on certain issues. Uh, immigration, California has been a leader on those issues. On DACA, we took the lead in Texas on that one. And so, you know, we have a network. We know who to reach out to that once you sort of build some momentum and, uh, you know, we'll have calls, and even the ones who don't sign on are not saying no, they're just saying not right now. Uh, and so there is a pretty fluid process. Uh, and then when you want all the 50 to try to sign on or you want the National Association to get involved, there's a process by which you float, uh, you know, your, your letter or your complaint 
uh, to the organization. If you hit a certain number, then you could get the imprimatur of, of uh, the National Association of AGs too. So there, there are a lot of loose networks around issues and organized ones as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's Jamesburg, yeah. Yeah, so, so I think uh, Jersey uh, ha has been a leader on this issue. We're one of the uh, um, you know, only states uh, that has fully implemented uh, uh, the Juvenile Detentions Alternatives Initiative that the Casey Foundation put forward. I think we're the first state to do that. Uh, so Jamesburg is the, the secure facility for boys. Uh, we're in the process of closing it. Uh, but before even closing it, there's about 150 or so boys there right now young men. Uh, we were at something like 2,000 about 15 years ago. So we're at, so we've done a lot to push uh, alternatives to incarceration for youth. Uh, even on the pretrial detention, uh, we're at, two, uh, I think about 2,000 now. We were at 12,000 over a decade ago. So we've come down. Uh, we're going to close Jamesburg and we're building three smaller, more community uh, style facilities where it doesn't look like an institution. You're not on a hundred acre campus in dorms. It's more therapeutic. Uh, it's a model that other states have, have implemented, uh, about 30 to 40 uh, young men at each of those facilities. Uh, for Hayes, which is our secure facility for women, I think we have 12 detainees right now. And so, you know, it's hard to find a, sp I'd love to close down Hayes as well, but we don't have a facility where we could uh, put them that's more in the community. But that's the trend across the country. That's the best practice, and that's where we're going. And, and, and we're also doing the JDAI is where it's a team approach where in, in the juvenile courtrooms, you have the prosecutor, you have the public defender or defense attorney, and then you have all the stakeholders there, the, the service providers, that if you have options a judge can sort of pass folks off to, uh, you know, that's right there and that's working great for us. And we're also uh, revamping our, the way we do station house adjustments because we have to fix the racial disparities on the juvenile side, which are striking in New Jersey, and we're working on that. Question? Yes, ma'am. So I, I don't know uh, if, you know, I don't know if, I don't have that data point in front of me if the racial disparities have stayed the same as our prison population has come down or, or whether they've increased. And that's something we should probably look into. Uh, it, we have a very, this is probably a, a unique moment in, in, in history in New Jersey law enforcement where we have like a very close relationship with the ACLU and, and different stakeholders. For example, that immigrant trust directive that I spoke about. Uh, that was formed with over the course of eight months with the ACL, ACLU at the table, Make the Road at the table, all sorts of organizations along with prosecutors coming together to, to make good policy. So uh, I just say that because we work closely with them, and that issue has not been brought to my attention as a problem in New Jersey, uh, but we'll look into it. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I, I don't have that data point in front of me, but I, I think that's something we'll probably follow up and look at um, because um, that would be a concern. Uh, but it, ha it hasn't been brought to our attention as being an issue by the ACLU or others. Okay. Yes, sir.
Not yet. No. Medical marijuana is, 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 has been uh, introduced. We don't. Uh, our legislature is still uh, considering competing uh, bills right now. Uh, my understanding from reading the newspapers is that they're close. Uh, and oh yeah, New Jersey is New Jersey is as well. And and according to recent reporting, it's imminent. Um, so I, I we don't have any experience with it. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we'd be happy to, to talk to you. I mean, certainly it's one of the unintended consequences that we flagged for, we haven't weighed in on the, the decision that that's gonna be the, our legislators and our governor, uh, but the unintended consequences, whether it's increased uh, motor vehicle accidents, the black market because of the tax rates, you know, still being pretty high, uh, there's always going to be a black market. Uh, and so we've highlighted that from an enforcement perspective. I saw the Colorado study on that. That's the only one that I've seen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Can you hear more about the policy? I'm very frank. Like, I'm an attorney, too. Um, and I think there's always just going to be more enforcement for us and our consumers to play with. But the issue that I was struck with is, is that being a, is it a model that's going to be elsewhere? Because there's so much, I don't know a lot about that Right. Right. So, so um, w whether it could be a, a model for the rest of the country, I hope so. Uh, what's unique about New Jersey uh, is that the way our law enforcement system is structured in New Jersey, uh, as AG, I have uh, direct supervisory authority over all our county prosecutors, all 21 of them. And then I have direct supervisory authority. They're the chief law enforcement officers in their counties. Uh, and by virtue of being in that role, they oversee all the municipal departments. I mean, they're still appointed by the local towns, but they have disciplinary and supervisory authority. And as a result, I have supervisory authority over all 36,000 cops in, in the state of New Jersey. And so I have the ability uh, through our Criminal Justice Act to issue a law enforcement directive, which is binding on them. So that is policy for all of our law enforcement officers, our sheriff's officers, our corrections officers, that they have to abide by that policy. And, and that policy, you know, it's, it's available on our website. It's about uh, 10 pages. It goes into specific detail on what can be asked, what can't be asked uh, before a stop, uh, what information can be shared with ICE and what can't be shared with immigration authorities. It, it puts a limit on 287G agreements. We have four in our state. Uh, and the directive says before any department decides to enter into a new one or renew an old one, uh, the AG has to approve it. Uh, and I, I, there has to be good reasons for it. And uh, I've, as I've told different audiences, I don't know of any good reasons for them. Uh, and so it lays out very clearly. Also, importantly, uh, detainers. Uh, we will honor a detainer in the most serious uh, case, right? If the person's charged in a serious case, but even then we won't hold someone past uh, that day. You know, so if, if, if John Smith is being released today, uh, and it's a certain serious offense from which he's being released after serving his time. Uh, and ICE, you know, ICE will find out uh, once he's processed and everything on the front end. But if they have a detainer request, we'll hold him till 11.59, but no longer. You know, just to the end of that day in a very narrow uh, set of circumstances. We won't let authorities come into our jails to interview anyone without notifying them of their, their, their rights uh, and their right to have an attorney present and their right to refuse that interview request. So it's pretty broad and sweeping, 
by virtue of the way we're structured uh, in New Jersey. We have the authority, yeah. 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 I, I don't think, I mean, very few uh, AG's offices have complete criminal authority. Uh, Delaware probably, Delaware does because they're a small state and, you know, they are, you know, they have authority and they could probably do it. But even then, I don't think they have authority over their corrections officers and their sheriff's officers. And it's just by way of our, our structure where we're able to do a lot of that reform in that way. And, and to, you know, Andrew's, the issues Andrew highlighted, you know, we had a patchwork of policies and departments. Some had random drug testing, some had early warning systems. You know, it, with the, not a, you know, just not just on my signature, we brought people together and we developed a policy and we implemented it and we were able to change uh, practice because of that. And so it's a pretty powerful tool, but we do it in a collaborative way. I'm not gonna ask you how much more time you got because Rachel's telling me, so I'll keep going until you tell me that. Like two more? Two more? So, um, you know, th that, that's a tough question because, I mean, it's, you know, we have 9 million uh, residents in our state. We have 565 towns, and we have a lot of police departments. Um, so individual policing practices, it's, you know, it's difficult for us to, to have that sort of visibility. But if there are sort of racial disparities in arrest rates or use of force or other data points, we're doing better, and we're trying to do better to use all those data points to mine them to identify patterns and practices and intervene early. Uh, another area that, that we're going to really take a deep dive into is municipal fines and fees. Uh, you know, going to you know, racial disparities or other issues. I would like to know that if we have a town on the Jersey Shore, are they writing 50% of their tickets to their residents or to people transiting through, right? So are they using folks who are coming through as a source of revenue? Uh, or are they, you know, fairly, using fines and fees. And in light of the recent Supreme Court decision, we want to be even more mindful of fines and fees types of issues and forfeiture issues. So, you know, we're trying to get better on data collection. We're trying to talk to more stakeholders and institutions like John Jay because, because of our structure, we have the ability to implement policies and collect data in a way I don't think many states can uh, and, and to really do something with it. So uh, that's where we want to trend to, to use data to identify those types of patterns and practices and, and root them out where we can. Matter of fact, in two weeks, we're having a fellowship program on fines and fees. Okay, great. Andrew? <laughs> All right. Right. So I, I, that's a great question. I mean, the question was, um, have we gotten buy-in from, from our police chiefs and our prosecutors? Uh, w when you have 21 counties and you have 500 plus police chiefs in New Jersey, it's, it's hard to get buy-in from, from everyone. But I, I think given the background that I have, being a federal prosecutor for most of my career, being a county prosecutor, having worked with law enforcement and them knowing where I come from, when I come to these issues and try to, you know, sort of push, I think, what are arguably more progressive policies than they are used to, um, you know, I think I have a little bit more credibility, but the process by which we're doing it, I think, helps as well. We have a very collaborative process. So when we are putting together a statewide use of force policy, we're dealing in the FOP, we're dealing in the state PBA and the different police unions and prosecutors associations, and we're dealing in uh, stakeholders and rights groups as well, and we're all sitting around the same table and coming up with a policy, knowing that not all of us are going to agree on this uh, and that we're gonna try to get it to a point you know, where we could all you know, walk away with this 
and, and say, walk away from this and say, you know what, we, this is a good policy because none of us are happy. Uh, and I think the Immigrant Trust Directive was a perfect example because when we announced it, we announced it uh, at Ellis Island, uh, at the train station there, um, at Liberty State Park rather, and we had the chiefs of police from our five major cities. We had the prosecutors from those cities there. We had the colonel of the state police, the state police. We had uh, Make the Road, we had ACLU, we had all sorts of groups standing there together and, and sharing in, in that announcement. And I think that's just sort of an example uh, of how that collaborative process you know, brings people together and you get buy-in. Not everyone's happy. Uh, and you know, I'll go to the PBA convention and I'll take heat, uh, but I'll, I'll tell them why I'm doing it. And you know, at the end of the day, it is what it is. It's my decision, so. I want to thank you yeah. for your time. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Stephen.